Welcome to Night Shadows. I'm Stuart Best. Where the paranormal is normal. Where that which you thought you knew, you didn't. And where the future can be known, if you know exactly where to look. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for tuning in and listening. Uh, we're very honored to have uh, Stan Dale back again. Uh, we were talking on the first show about 923, which has come and gone. And uh, we also have Larry with us. And uh, hi, Stan. How are you doing tonight? All good. Good. I've uh, been uh, busy over the weekend, like everybody else, getting things done, caught up, and getting ready for winter. Yeah. It sounds like possibly we might have a nasty winter. Uh, hi, Larry. How are you? Hey, Stuart. Hey, Stan. Larry's doing the same thing, getting ready for winter. We're having changes here, too, early. Yeah. 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 I think they might have been wearing coats already. Say again, Stan? I think we've been wearing coats already. It's starting to cool off here. Yeah. It's been kind of chilly. Now we got snow in, uh, I think it was New Hampshire. We've had snow, I think, in Montana, Idaho, and those areas. So, yeah, it sounds like a very mixed-up season. Uh, I was going to read something from uh, the Book of Enoch. Anyway, it talks about the times of the sinners, which I take to be Daniel's 70th week, the final week. And it more or less indicates that the seasons are getting all messed up. And... uh, they begin to kind of merge and change, and uh, is that not what's happening? Yeah, of course it is. Um, You know, we have a a link on the show images page tonight uh, off our website, uh, standleo.com, and it says (laughs) show images down there with the microphone. And that link will take you to a thing there. I've got a, 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 a link on the top row there to image 42, which is about, uh, it's an article it links you to on National Geographic, which explains why the hurricane season this year has been so catastrophic. You know, how many things have gone wrong with the fork, you know, the rainforest and things like that to cause it. But whatever the causes mm-hmm. are, they are increasing, and they have been quite uh, damaging this year, and quite a few of them. I think the next thing will be, of course, um, earthquakes uh, that will follow along with and some volcanoes. There are a couple of those on the go at the moment as well. Do you know what image was that, 42, you said? Yeah, 42. It's in the top row on the right. Okay. Got it. Yeah, I, there, there's something really going on, and people just are not. Well, if you don't survey, how do I word this? I'm sure Larry agrees. If you don't survey the world and what's going on all around the world, you probably wouldn't notice. You might, oh, okay, we've had a bad hurricane this season. That's happened before. But when you put it all together, there are huge changes going on. Uh, what do you think, Larry? Oh, absolutely, and I was going to tell Stan and get his opinion. You know, he and Holly once uh, talked about some data they had where USGS was somewhat hiding some of the earthquakes, and the other day I was on when the earthquake storms, uh, swarms began to happen offshore of uh, northern California, and, uh, around, you know, the, the, it was west of Ferndale, California, and there was swarm after swarm. I saw them showing up being updated on my site, and I was writing them down in longhand, and I posted a lot of those, and I was I was watching that, and, you know, like a 5.9 and a 5.7 and threes and fours and all of this, and then suddenly the updates start coming in, and they started disappearing. Some of them would begin to vanish. What do you think, Stan? Well, some of them will, will uh, disappear because they are uh, automatically recorded and sent to the USGS computer. And uh, then a human uh, reviews the signal to determine whether it's some other cause, like a uh, mining blast, a truck by, driving by too close to the sensor. Sometimes that happens, not often. But And then when it's been reviewed and found to be false data, they take it off. But you have to wonder about anything over about a Richter 2.5 that disappears, if that's a glitch or they just kind of don't want you to look at it. You know, you got to wonder. Well... You ran into problems, Stan, with your uh, Navy 
uh, usage of uh, things to determine where earthquakes were, and they obviously didn't think that you needed to have that. So yeah. why would they think that unless well, they are an, trying to hide stuff? Well, um, yeah, quite possibly. I mean, I'm I'm trying to think of reasons to justify why they do some of these things, and sometimes it's hard to do. But um, a lot of the time I used to, well, in fact, I, I don't anymore, but I used to just ring up the USGS guys to talk to them about something that was strange and see if it had a valid explanation, and it usually did. Um, but if you look uh, on that uh, image, I think it's 40 and 41 on the top there, there are two volcanoes that are causing people to be evacuated, one in, uh, near Bali and another near Vanuatu. Um, you know, and thousands of people are being moved to get out of the way of massive eruptions. Um, these go along with earthquakes. The earthquakes usually precede them, and then you have the, the volcanic eruptions. Fortunately, we have the technology to uh, most of the time get people out of the way. Um, mm-hmm. Take, uh, oh, what was it, in the Philippines uh, oh, several years ago, Pinatubo. Um, the USGS team sitting there watching that because they had a, a, a base there was afraid at first to tell the people, the you know, the, the base commander and the local residents, uh, Pinatubo is going to erupt, and it may be a big one because they weren't certain. It was kind of, you know, unproven data that they were looking at. And uh, they kicked it around the room there and said, well, look, I don't know. If we, if we, if we say there's going to be a big eruption and they move millions of people around, uh, it'll cost everybody a lot of money and heartache and, um, you know, panic. And uh, if, we're, you know, if we're wrong, that'll happen. If we're right, well, of course, we'll save a lot of people. So we'll either heroes or villains, whichever way, you know, it, it turns out we've got to either be a hero or a villain. So they mm-hmm. they debated this, and I watched a, um, a documentary where they interviewed these people, and, and quite seriously, they were uh, wanting to keep it uh, keep from announcing it officially because of the threat to their jobs, uh, you know, about falsely or allegedly falsely predicting the volcano. Mm-hmm. Now we're in the same position now. There are things occurring around the Pacific Rim of Fire, the, the Arc of Fire. Um, which are, you know, big earthquakes and uh, earthquake sw- uh, swarms. Uh, the, uh, in fact, the past seven days I'm just looking at now, we, the most recent was a 7.1 down in uh, 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 Utla, Mexico, and that's following, you know, the Victor 8 or so down uh, just a little bit south of there near Oaxaca, uh, Mexico. And, you know, Richter 5s, 5.5s and 6s in the last two weeks have been rather numerous, at least over 14 of them that I've counted, all with the exception of two over in Iran and one down at the South Pole um, near the Sandwich Islands, uh, the South Sandwich Islands, with the exception of those, they've been all along the fault line in the rim, you know, the Pacific Rim. More of them seem to be occurring on the left side opposing Central America and Mexico. Now, we just had one uh, up... um, in Ferndale, California, which was a 5.7, and it was just right near the, the in fact, on the line, the, the, the break, if you wish, of the um, Juan de Fuca plate. Now, that one, it, you, we have to watch that all the time because there's a Richter 9-plus building in that area. It has been for over 65 years. It's the only area where that kind of stress has been building up in that kind of a fault line on the entire uh, Pacific Arc and part of the one that goes through Indonesia, you know, to Java. Uh, that has not released its stress. It's way, way overdue. So we have to be watching that area very closely, in my opinion, because we are we are about to see something rather interesting. And if you look at the USGS plots, um, mm-hmm. you know, for the last week, you will see that there are a number of smaller quakes, you know, in the, the range of about uh, two and a half to three, right on that same line of the Juan de Fuca foot down there. Um, and today and yesterday, there have been a number of them down in Southern California, the Salton Sea, uh, inland a bit, uh, near a fault line that we have kind of been watching, which might hit, um, what is it, Costa, let's see, Costa Mesa, I think they call it anyway. It's a little suburb-type town just south of um, L.A., and uh, it may well uh, create a a series of faults, if not the one that triggers the San Andreas Fault all the way to the Imperial Fault going down into Mexico. I, I think we're going to see 
uh, some serious earthquake activity in the United States as well as along the Pacific Rim. Well, we are in that, uh, how do we say, sign of Jonah 40 days still. <clears throat> and I guess we have that hurricane off the uh, Maria. Is that going to join up with Jose? Is anybody uh, saying they that anymore? No, they haven't said any more about that. <laughs> and I think probably they'll see uh, you know, high coastal seas uh, up near South Carolina and stuff, or maybe North Carolina, but... Um, mm-hmm. I think it's going to miss our coast. There have to be uh, a number of other factors in the wind to uh, cause the the hurricanes coming up the coast like that to dive inland and hit the coast. Now, the um, the forecasts that I've seen do not show. I'm just pulling it up now to be sure what I'm telling you is correct. They don't show any uh, contributing winds from, uh, well, from the from the high altitude jet stream going down. They don't show any contributing winds that would tend to drive it into the coast other than a depression that's circulating at the moment over to the, mm, let's see, what island is that? Over to the south of Iceland in the North Atlantic. And it's it's got winds that are actually uh, encouraging the spin of uh, Maria, uh, whose winds at the moment are not, you know, like a, Category five or anything, they're pretty slow. Uh, the range of you know, at the high speeds around 50 miles an hour in the eye of it. So, it's not going to move fast. And when I look at you know at about oh, four days ahead, it uh, moves on out to sea, and uh, I don't think it will hit anything to anybody's country. That's uh, you know a lot of a much of a worry. Um, but there are so many of those little low pressure air depressions forming in the Atlantic this year, this season, that you have to wonder, you know, what the heck is going on? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe the Lord's trying to uh, speak to humanity. I mean, if you go around, the, go around the entire planet, all kinds of things are going on. Uh, earthquakes, yeah, well, I'm concerned. flooding, I'm concerned. and everything else. <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, I am concerned about the southwestern part of the uh, Ring of Fire, the Ark of Fire. If we have these volcanoes and the attendant uh, earthquakes and and jolts that may occur when they erupt, and uh, they are directly across from the um, Juan de Fuca area, if you draw equal lines around the, you know, if you follow the fault lines around the the, uh, Mm -hmm. Ark of Fire, where they meet is, you know, northwest, uh, you know, our coast. And if the shock waves meet there and trigger something that's ready to release, well, we, we could see it. You know, the big one and a series of, of follow-ups could hit the west coast all the way down to Baja. Mm-hmm. Didn't you have a vision, if I remember, about volcanoes going off all along up and down that uh, California? I did, it, 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 actually. It, yeah, go ahead. Go on. I was just well, curious because you, it, the fire, I think it was related to a fire uh, meteor shower or something, if I remember right. Um, that was another one about the beginning of something. This is it, it begins now type thing. When I was over, I was in that one. I um, you know, I'll explain that in a minute. But let me get back to the West Coast. Um, yes, the West Coast. When I saw, I was in the air over the United States over uh, probably just off the shore of uh, Washington State. And I was looking at the, the plumes of uh, smoke and fire and stuff coming from volcanoes there in Washington State and in Oregon all the way down to Mexico City, to Popocatépetl. And what would that be, six or seven volcanoes, the Cascadias, and then down in the, into the Sierra Madres, down that area, uh, all going off at once. And they were spewing up ash, and, uh, and uh, water was, of course, condensing from the steam and falling onto the roads. And people were trying to get uh, east of California, get across the mountains all along there, and were sliding off. Their cars were, their tires were sliding off as they were going too fast around corners. And if you've ever been on any of those um, roads in the mountains around California, they're trying to get over the other side. There are some of those uh, roads that are pretty, pretty bad, even dry. But uh, I saw people sliding off of that. So. Uh, we could see the the start of that, um, you know, fairly soon. So there are things happening up in Washington State. Um, you know, uh, Mount Rainier and uh, Mount uh, St. Helens uh, underneath there is still a you know a magma pool. 
and of course Yellowstone. Now, I didn't see Yellowstone in that because it was on the other side of the mountain range, but um, that was it. And the one you're talking about as far as the, the like the rain of burning embers, you know, like they were like things from a fire that, you know, like pieces of paper or something blown up in the, the you know, the plume of a fire. And mm-hmm. they had flames behind rather than streaks like a meteor. These were like burning flames coming down. Now, again, uh, when I saw that, it um, I was over an area in the desert here near, uh, well, where we are now, near Pueblo, Colorado. And uh, I could tell by the terrain and where it was on the map. And off to the um, uh, uh, west of that is where I saw these uh, flaming things start to fall one or two or three at a time down toward California. And then they increased in, in intensity and that kind of stuff. And I, I, was, I could f- see the flames of them on the people's faces that I was uh, talking to there in the desert. Uh, the first part of the dream, they, I was there waking up these people that were intense with little alarm clocks by them, and they were all gathered together there in the desert, um, you know, out of the cities and uh, waiting for something, but they'd fallen asleep. And they were covered in something like spider webbing. So I'd gone around and torn the web off of people. I was waking them up and saying, you've overslept. Get up. You know, it's time now. You, you know, don't go to sleep now. It begins. And then when I saw those flaming embers start to become like a waterfall of fiery things falling toward California, I turned. You know, I saw their faces were all lit up with the, the flames flickering from these things falling. And I said, now oh. go back and tell your people it begins now. So I think these people were like watchmen that had not been alert to things, and suddenly, you know, they were being awakened, and I was telling them, get out there and tell your people that, you know, that I guess it's the judgment that coming to the tribulation. Uh, it never explained in the dream what it was, but it says it begins now, when, like when you see this sign. Well, they may be connected, I don't know. And Larry, you had a dream about uh, Oklahoma. What was that, Broken Bow? Where that rift? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a big rift that had developed. And, and, and there was a big rift. Explain that. that. Which Broken Bow, Broken Bow's in the western part of uh, southeast Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, towards the Arkansas area. But this rift seemed to come back, come down. It appeared, uh, the best I could tell, to come out of the north like it was down through... Uh, up around Oklahoma City, possibly up into, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, Kansas there somewhat, but on down. But it was a big rip. If you've ever seen the movie uh, 10.0 Apocalypse, or I believe that was the name of it, uh, a number of years ago where a rip opened up, it was somewhat like that one. And, uh, of course, in the movie it went all the way to the Gulf of Mexico in the movie, but uh, I only saw it in Oklahoma and... uh, but, but it's ironic, though, that uh, a lot of the water drillers the last number of years in this area claim that all the, the caverns or the aquifers below pretty much are empty. They're vacant. They're just, they're just uh, you know, there's nothing there. Mm. And uh, so, you, you know, some of the ground can just cave in. Yeah. Now, Larry, when you saw that, I'm oh, sorry, go on. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Steph. Oh, all right. Well, Larry, when you saw that rift, was it running east, west, or north, south? It was running somewhat uh, north towards the southwest. North toward the southwest. In other hmm. words, from uh, up north of Oklahoma, maybe Cushing, back up in that way, up to uh, the border. It was running down, uh, I guess you would say, I'm trying to think of towns, uh, maybe inside or the the, uh, the side of uh, I guess uh, down to right the edge of the Ochotas, the Mountain Gateway as they call it, and down through that region uh, towards Texas. Now I, I couldn't see it going to the Texas border. I didn't see that. It might have. I don't know. But this was really a big rift, and it was like one you would almost see in the movies. It was big. <laughs> And uh, very remarkable. All right, I was just trying to look and see there. That would be uh, almost like the fracking uh, you know, areas with empty zones underneath them, cracking toward uh, Oklahoma City and down toward the Red River, but not not, not reaching it maybe. 
reason I ask is because there is, uh, as you and I have talked about over the phone, a fault line running sort of uh, right angles to what you're talking about going um, west-east, which joins that region up above Oklahoma City over to the New Madrid fault line. Um, and, you know, there is talk that perhaps we'll see some more activity in the New Madrid fault line in the near future. Whether or not we will or not, I don't know, but um, it's been fairly quiet. No small quakes over the last uh, 30 days over the New Madrid. So, uh, you know, the pressure could be building there as well. We wouldn't know. But certainly there have been a lot of uh, the, the normal, you know, um, say 3.8 down to 2.5, those kind of earthquakes around uh, the north part of Oklahoma City, which I assume would be due to the, the fracking and stuff. It would be west of Tulsa and uh, kind of n- north northwest of Oklahoma City. In fact, even up into, into Kansas near Wichita. Wichita. Mm. Anyway, yeah. Well, there have been a number of visions, and one fellow had a vision, and he was told two hurricanes back-to-back, and then two uh, earthquakes, one on the east coast, one on the west coast. And then there was God another earthquake, which the Lord said, um, it's too bad, it's too horrible, I'm not going to tell you what it is. That hmm. would be the third one. Hmm. Uh, now he said, "He said, where were they again? Tell me again, the three earthquakes. There would, he wasn't told where the third one was, but one was on the west coast. And one mm-hmm. was on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. And I think the East Coast one involved a tsunami as well. All right. And the third one and you would say because it was so terrible? Yeah, then the third one. And I'm wondering, because of all the th- uh, sightings of Mothman, I mean, they are just coming out of the woodwork now, right, Larry? I mean, you've been sending me one virtually every day around Chicago. And I'm wondering, because of the visions of a huge earthquake in Chicago that empties the Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan, down to the Gulf, if that's not the third one, which the Lord said was too horrible, he didn't want to talk about it much. I guess that could be uh, connected to the New Madrid. It's close enough, the northern part of it, yeah. anyway. What do you think about this mid-continent rift? Situation it goes from Lake Superior down through Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then it, it seems to end only a couple hundred miles from the New Madrid. Could that be the area or the Chicago one that splits the United States in two, as per the prophecies that if we split Israel and Jerusalem in two, we're going to get split in two? I, what do you, you know, think, guys? I certainly, uh, yeah, yeah. What do you think, Larry? Uh, it's very, uh, I think it's very feasible. I know that uh, a guy by the name of Chuck Youngbrandt, and uh, he was from out of Washington Way. He had a really incredible experience, and I think uh, Stuart posted some of that data on a Chicago earthquake that went up into Canada and then down to the Mississippi. And then uh, Red Elk also uh, had shared information, you know, about the very same type of earthquake and, and give a, gave Chicago as a, and the uh, what is it, Lake Michigan, I believe, uh, as being a main trouble point at yes. one time in the future. Yeah, well, that's he's, what he's. Yeah, what what Red Elk saw was a huge earthquake under Lake Michigan, where the land rose on the south side of this break and pushed the water up into Canada, and then it reversed itself, and all the water went down south, wiped out Chicago, and all points to the south down to the Gulf. I guess it was fairly quick and fairly sudden, he said, that he was shown that. And, you know, you just mentioned, Stan, the uh, earthquake situation in uh, uh, the two volcanoes out there in Washington State. Uh, so he said that Mount St. Helens was going to blow again, and he saw it. But this time it's going to blow towards the west. And then uh, Rainier was going to blow its top. Now, this is funny, and I, 
and it's not funny, I guess, but weird. This is how he said he saw it. And I know uh, some mountain climbers that have gone up into Mount Rainier, and they've both said that Mount Rainier is basically a rotten mountain, that it's been virtually destroyed by all the uh, little quakes and the volcanic activity, but inside, they, I, I guess when they go up there for mountain climbing, they actually go into some of these uh, volcanic tubes, and that's where they camp out. But he he did make the mention that it was kind of a rotten mountain, and it, you know, and Red Elk claimed that the entire third top of the mountain blew off in one huge explosion. Was he going said wet? he saw it rise up, turn around, and come back down and plug the hole it made. <laughs> and he said that the um, shockwave of that was just devastating. It wiped out Seattle and points around there. Would that be possible, do you think? Well, uh, yeah. The um, uh, the interesting thing is that um, in the book of Revelation, uh, that we are told that a burning mountain will fall into the sea. Now, that's not exactly into the sea. That's why I ask you about what direction the top of Rainier, what he saw, was going to do. Uh, I think it's more likely to be the one down in uh, North Island, New Zealand, at uh, the, the Lake Taupo Caldera. Uh, one of those volcanoes will blow its top and down into the the lake uh, Taupo, which is really called the sea by the natives. But um, if Rainier were to, to blow its top off, you know, the top third, you would have to blow it a long way. Uh, and from what you're saying, he said about the shock wave. It could do that, but it'd have to go up and out and over into the ocean on the West Coast to fulfill that as a the biblical prophecy. But, um, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's possible. Um, and I do think we're going to see some interesting things here. I've been watching the Middle East peace process, you know, uh, with uh, Trump's son-in-law uh, wandering around in Egypt and over there trying to make peace between the Arabs and the Palestinians and Israel. Mm-hmm. And so the, the threat... Or, however you want to take it, the promise of the threat of a peace treaty in the Middle East, which divides Israel, is close at hand, maybe the next few months sometime. And as you say, uh, we can expect the U.S. to be divided should they uh, divide or, or make a treaty that divides the land of Israel. Um, that uh, Lake Michigan thing, what is really kind of interesting to me about that is if you look at Lake Michigan on a map, you'll see it's kind of got like a, oh, like a teardrop shape to it. And Mm -hmm. there's been recent uh, exploration underneath Lake Michigan, and I think it's the site of an ancient times asteroid impact that stopped just off the Chicago coastline and that it weakened the crust of the Earth by this impact. There's still more studies going on about it, but um, I know from looking at other things I've found on the uh, Appalachian Range that there's signs of a large meteor that uh, went from Pennsylvania all the way down to uh, to Atlanta, to Georgia area uh, in ancient days and formed part of the Appalachian Mountain Ridge. It weakens the crust. Oh. So now uh, that thing about Chicago and a, and a quake up there, you know, a fault line, uh, uh, you know, erupting or, or you know, uh, breaking down does make sense because wherever there's been one of these large meteors that formed a, a ridge in the seabed, like uh, oh, at uh, the, the southern tip of uh, Argentina, there's one near the uh, the Antarctic. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the Altanen meteor, its footprint is similar to the base of Lake Michigan in shape, and it's a long footprint, you know, a long trail like that. So that's a weak area, and we know that, that should the New Madrid get a certain type of shock, it may fracture, and uh, you know, water may flow. You know, through a bigger channel down through there, in essence, dividing the country. Oh. The, the the New Madrid fault zone is not really a fault line. Um, it's it's more like vertical, cooled, crystalline structures like cells that formed uh, when the eastern part of the United States almost uh, separated from the western side along there and formed a separate uh, continent, but it didn't quite mm-hmm. finish, and so it cooled with these kind of crystalline structures like honeycombs. I think that's probably the best way to explain it. And uh, that uh, 
that then makes it not a, not a, a fault line, but a fault zone. And uh, certainly um, the uh, USGS has looked at that area, but they've put their fault um, seismic threat map down around Nashville, you know, or, or right there in the middle of the um, Mississippi, just west of Nashville. That's down there rather than up where I would I thought it would have been, but uh, still. Um, mm. That area could be triggered by the Chicago uh, and uh, Lake Michigan quake if it does occur. Well, um, I read some time ago, a long time ago, and I was looking for it and I couldn't find it, but it was uh, Native American, ancient Native American, uh, I guess you could call mythology that's not mythology, <laughs> Uh, where they said that a comet had carved out the Great Lakes. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? it uh, comet or an asteroid, it's, you know, comet's kind of the same thing, but speaking of, and it would have put all that water in there. Wow. Larry, what do you think about all this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it does make some sense. Uh, I was thinking, you know, I remember Stan Deo, I think he's still got the map up, of uh, uh, maybe it's uh, John Michael Scallion or, or someone, uh, but there's a map he yeah. has up that's very interesting. You know, Stan said that uh, a lot of this zone, uh, New Madrid, is like honeycomb. Well, if all of that, if it, that got hit with a sharp jolt, a lot of that could just crumble and cave in, which if it caved in all the way down to the Gulf almost, uh, the water from the uh, Gulf would come rushing in, probably all the way up uh, as far as it could go. And you could begin to see where uh, an actual inland, inland sea could develop. Guys, if you're still on my show images page, go down the bottom yeah, of you're... that. Go down the bottom of the images five and six and click on six first. This is from talking to the Hopi. Yes. Oh, and click... yeah, the one with the... Uh... The water in the U.S. is going to be in trouble. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's see. Okay. <laughs> With states here, let me just pull this up. Okay. The top left image, um, the top one that has the states thrown in. Yes. Uh, enlarge that and look at it, and you can see this is. I did this just by taking uh, sea levels. Uh, uh, you know, if they rose uh, in this case by 200 feet only, uh, whether they rise 200 feet or not. It does show you where the thin areas, where the, the low areas of the United States are in the New Madrid area going up toward Lake Michigan. Um, and if you look oh. at Illinois there, you'll see a little green uh, finger yep. of a, like a river. Okay, right near where that uh, uh, arrow is. And the green areas are at 500 feet, but it's showing you a, a weakness in the, cr in the mantle. And if you follow oh. the little finger of it up, it almost reaches Chicago. So that's your that's connection. That's what the guy said. Connection. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, you see what I'm saying? It's on that map. Now, forget the west, the west side of the map because there are some other things that, that uh, may bring water between the, the mesas for the Hopi in um, in Arizona. I don't think that uh, the west coast is going to drop by a, a mile to make that happen, but that shows you what would happen if it uh, dropped to the level it needed to to um, make water run between the mesas. I think it's going to be a block Colorado River at, in the Grand Canyon, and that will flow into, you know, that will build a, like a lake into northern Arizona. That's what's going to separate the mesas. You can see where the red arrow and the red dot says the Hopi Nation. And if you zoom it up, just click on the picture, you'll see three little kind of water inlets which separate mm -hmm. the three mesas. Okay. They, if that, for that to be underwater, I, I do think that what we'll see is the uh, Colorado River. You can see how it, uh, it snakes on down through Utah and down into there. If that were blocked that the water would just pile up there over a few months or whatever. But when that happens... Well, what's interesting, too, is you got this uh, Chuck Youngbrandt in his vision, when Michigan emptied, it went to the west, right where you've got that green line. Well, and I didn't solved. realize that. Well, that's, that, does, that does say that's where it would naturally go, so I guess he could be very well telling the truth. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Well... Um, and, uh, and, and if you go back to the show images page down to, to the bottom there to image uh, five or slide five and click on that, that gives you several other looks at um, 
uh, craton lines uh, through the United States, weaknesses uh, and rifts. And at the top of that page, these aren't numbered by slide, so at the top row you see New Madrid and rifts. And if you mm -hmm. uh, connect to the second image, which says rifts, and look at that, those yellow outlines are the weakness rifts that they have already specified. It goes right up uh, to where we're talking about, just, just slightly west of Chicago. Do you see that? Uh-huh. I'll bet you that is what the Lord said would be the third one. And he yeah. said it was horrible. He didn't want to talk about it. Well, in uh, in uh, Chuck's vision, it devastates the entire middle of the country. Yeah. It flattens well, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and uh, virtually all points to the south. I mean, it would destroy the United States. There'd oh, be yeah. no way we would recover. Yeah, I know. The um, if you look at the first image where it has New Madrid in white with you know black outline, if you click on that, it doesn't go all the way up to Chicago, but the the blue uh, kind of weakness zone that they've put into this map, showing all the earthquakes along New Madrid, whatever. That shows you how much of that area could be covered and make it a lake even between east and west of the United States. Uh, near Carbondale, up the top where the little red dot is. That, well, that's, that's where the thing. sun solar eclipse was. went right over Carbondale. Oh, ah, yeah, I'd forgotten that. That's true. And the so one on the, uh, yeah, the one on the tw uh, 20, uh, seven years later also goes right over Carbondale. Isn't that right. interesting? <laughs> yeah, it is. And if you go to the the third image at the top where it says Eastern Fault Line of the New Madrid, you can see the New Madrid also connects over into uh, upper state New York, you know, into the river channel there. Uh, these are all <laughs> like official documents. Um, so that whole area uh, going up east, you could see some shaking in the eastern lake of the New Madrid where that red line goes up in uh, to the river. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, so, yeah, yeah, we're in interesting times. I, I do think that what we're seeing here is the beginning of the judgments we're talking about. I, I'm, well, I'm, what's interesting, we were talking about 923 and the possibility of the rapture of the church, but uh, nothing happened at all. I mean, it was zero, nothing. Well, Everybody, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, again, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, you know, that... Uh, you know, give up on that. It's a sign of the season. And, uh, you know, in this season, it could be weeks or months, but we're seeing the season starts with that sign at its maximum. That tells you, okay, you're you're in the season. So somewhere in that season, I do think we may see the rapture, but it could go as late as barley harvest in, uh, you know, first quarter, late first quarter of next year. Uh, so keep looking up. I wouldn't tell people to be disappointed at all. Well, what was interesting is is the, we had the 33 days from the eclipse right. to 923, right? Right. And then we had everybody uh, that was watching was more or less shouting, the king is coming, the king is coming, get ready. And uh, it went by with nothing. Seven days later is the Feast of Atonement. And what is what was discovered is of all the seven feast days for the year, atonement is where the last trumpet is blown. Yes. And so we should be looking possibly that atonement is where this is at and that the midnight cry occurred on 923, get ready, Seven days later at atonement, bang, it's done. Because Makes sense. My, my, my question was to the Lord, and I, like I told uh, Larry on the phone, I said, you know, I was quite angry at the Lord. How <laughs> in the world could you have so many things pointing to 923 from the rabbis? From the cosmos itself, the signs in the heaven, the right. blood moon tetrads, uh, from the occult, 
all of these pointing to this one day. And why would you do that? And the answer, I think, came back, just wait. Midnight cry and the days of Noah, what was Noah told? And yet seven days. Isn't it odd that yet seven days from 923 is atonement? Yes. Again, uh, you know, I say keep looking up, whether it's, uh, you know, the seventh end of the seventh day when the last trump is blown, it happens on that moment, or later. But we are in the season, uh, and it's just a oh, good yeah. time to be sure that you're looking up all the time and asking to be found worthy in that. And uh, get on with life, your normal life after that. But uh, certainly be witnessing the people that are on the edge of uh, believing and, and accepting the Lord, because their time is uh, pretty short. Yeah. Uh, Larry, got any questions for Stan? Well, I would. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested. You know, Stan. Uh, you know, we're looking at. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. Since 9:23, in case that was a kind of a pivot, a little bit uh, towards the Middle East. You know, you mentioned the uh, the peace, either the problem or the situation that uh, Trump and Jared Kushner and Greenblatt and all of those are working on a peace plan in Israel. And I'm, I very well remember the uh, the previous peace plan that was developed, uh, you know, between uh, the Israelis and, uh, and uh, I guess it was uh, Arafat, Arafat, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, the Palestinian liberation thing. It was the Oslo Accords in the late 90s. Yeah, you remember that was uh, that was Israel, and uh, that was uh, I believe Egypt because uh, you know Egypt's uh, ruler was in, involved in that. I remember right after that peace plan, uh, both of those two individuals, the Israeli prime minister was assassinated, uh, Rabin, uh, Rabin, I believe it was, and then uh, the Israeli uh, leader. I mean, not the Israeli, the Egyptian leader was assassinated also. And what I find interesting, I don't know if you've watched the news closely the last few days, but um, they are pulling in Israel and now El Sisi out of Egypt into trying to construct this along with uh, the uh, Saudi crown prince, Salman. Uh, They're all working on it. And, And so I find it very interesting uh, and you mentioned it earlier. What is what do you see coming up on this so-called? If it is a pivot point, and we're now moving into the uh, the Middle East and Israel and uh, Jerusalem and all of those problems, <laughs> almost unsolvable. Uh, where do you see this going, or what do you expect to see next there? Well, we're getting close to uh, what uh, Holly wrote about in her book, The Prophetic Perils, about the first invasion of Israel. And I think, uh, uh, you know, she's put in there that that comes before the, uh, uh, you know, the Russian consortium comes down. Uh, Mm -hmm. You mentioned Prince Salman. Well, he has already joined 34 nations together, including Saudi Arabia, into an Arab alliance, and they've even had practice military drills between their their joint forces to fight Iran, right, because their brand, uh, Iran's brand of uh, Islam is in opposition to what um, uh, uh, the Saudis are and their allies. And so under the the cover of organizing these countries to head into uh, Syria and Iran, you know, to get the baddies, uh, the, the uh, princess going that direction, he will have an army from his country and from allied countries, even north of Israel, all converging on that point to get against Iran. And they may, they may well hit Iran, I don't know. But the point is, they will also have their forces and armament sitting up on the Golan Heights or very close to the border there with Syria. And all they need to do is make a left turn of a few miles, and they're into northern Israel. They could very well just do a, um, you know, a, a sly move and hit both Iran and Israel at the same time. And uh, I, I'm sure that the Israelis have been very cautious of the uh, the secret meeting between Prince Salman and um, Prime Minister Netanyahu about three weeks ago. Uh, it's been leaking out that the, the meeting took place, but uh, we know that uh, the Muslim faith allows the, the adherents to lie 
just blatantly lie to people that aren't believers or members of the, their faith in the efforts mm-hmm. to convert them to the faith or to get rid of them. So Prince Solomon could very well just have gone into Netanyahu and lied his face off so they can come in and make a surprise attack on Israel. So I'd keep an eye on that, that invasion there. What will happen, though, is their invasion forces will be sorely decimated by fire almost, uh, you know, uh, probably nuclear fire. And we think at that time that Israel will regain a big chunk of its biblical territory, including the northern half of Saudi Arabia all the way down to Riyadh, where uh, Prince Salman uh, was raised. So the, the, I see the potential for that uh, forming right now. And that kind of activity will, uh, you know, be the fertile ground for the Antichrist at this time. Now, there are two beasts spoken of in Revelation 12 or 13, 12, 13. Um, in 13, mainly, we're talking about the uh, uh, the Antichrist and then the, the, the false prophet, the second beast. Mm-hmm. The, the things like the numbering system, that kind of stuff, are usually attributed to the second beast who makes images of the first beast or the Antichrist and, you know, worship him, honor his, his picture and all that kind of stuff. So that means that the first beast, the Antichrist, has been neutered or, you know, either killed or um, taken out of his position of strength uh, and becomes an example for the the uh, false prophet to, to run the world. He does most of the things that people attribute normally to the Antichrist. Um so if the northern half of uh, Saudi Arabia is, is taken away by Israel defeating the Arab uh, invading forces under the direction of Prince Salman, Prince Salman could very well be wounded or uh, killed uh, in that exercise. And then whoever the false prophet is that, that uh, forms a global government will come to power. It might be Erdogan, uh, it might be someone else in Europe, but uh, that's where the major thrust is going to come from. And I think uh, Turkey is an ideal spot where the seat of Satan is, you know, to uh, have your your uh, false prophet come who does the most damage. Anyway, uh, all those things are, are, are falling into place for this period of time we're in. Uh, we're, we also have these geological or geophysical um, threats, you know, the, the, the weather the threats, mm-hmm. and these are going to produce a lot of uh, uh, diseases in the areas where they hit because, you know, the water will be polluted if available at all. Food will be short. People will be, you know, homeless. And uh, we see that in uh, Texas. We see a little bit of that in Florida, but certainly in Puerto Rico. And um, in other countries uh, which are being evacuated, you know, in the western Pacific for the volcanoes that are about to erupt. All these things are leading up to uh, ahead at the same time. Uh, the nuclear war threat, uh, the, uh, the environmental threats, and the economic threat is about to hit us. I think we're going to see real pressure on the, the world economy, starting with the New York Stock Exchange. Um, mm-hmm. There are just signs of everything weakening, like the U.S. dollar and China pulling away from that as a currency for oil deals. You know, they're, they're getting away from the dollar. So when all those come to a head, uh, and when the, the first beast, the Antichrist, uh, makes his move against Israel and is defeated, right in there is a point for a, a treaty to be made a peace treaty between Israel and the many nations around them. And that's the one that the, the Antichrist um, or the false prophet, one of the two of them, will ratify. I'm still kind of tossing back and forth which one of them does that. But there, at that point, when the ruler is established of the planet, it will be because he's backed by Satan and his forces posing as messengers of light in a great deception, saying that they are elder brothers from space, just like I wrote about in the Cosmic Conspiracy. In fact, mm-hmm. in the final edition of that in 2010, on around page 260 or so, um, I discuss eight verses in the book of Daniel which tell us about the uh, the uh, the God uh, of the, the, mm-hmm. the Antichrist worships, or not worships, but honors a God that was not the God of his fathers. And this God gives him power. And when I translate the Hebrew, it talks about that. And it's certainly Satan and his minions and um, how they're going to appoint this man to be the ruler of the earth and how they will give him technology to overthrow the uh, the, uh, the the basis, in essence, of the uh, defense leagues and attack uh, attack leagues of all the nations of the world. He, he'll be able to overthrow them with super technology from these, quote-unquote, aliens uh, that have landed to help us. So 
I think that's that's something we need to look for, the, the signs of that, of the increase in UFOs, especially big ones, uh, and then their sudden official revealing um, uh, disclosure to the public at a time when the world's about to blow itself apart from one thing or another. Wow. Is there any tie between Saudi Arabia and that uh, kind of an Area 51 you found there with the rise of Antichrist, do you think? Uh, and I know they built a huge uh, embassy over there in Iraq, and I always thought that that was kind of weird, but it might tie right into an arrival, that they would come back where they left in the first place. What do you think? Yeah, well, the uh, the whole Saudi Peninsula was, uh, uh, I'm positive that was what was in Greek legend, the Atlantean population. That's where Noah and uh, his sons and their wives, that's where they all lived before the flood, which destroyed the giants, you know, and, and the hi- hybrid beings of the Saudi Peninsula, which is what irritated God because they were me- messing with uh, genetic mutations and stuff on purpose and creating these half-human, half-angelic-type beings, which weren't really nice angels. They were they were weird. They were giants that ate people, if you look in the Book of Enoch, uh, I think mm-hmm. in chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Um, the giants turned against mankind and devoured them at that time. And these kind of fit in with some of the legends of Cyclops that used to eat people and that kind of junk. So, yeah, that area in the Middle East, particularly the Saudi Peninsula, which is not only Saudi Arabia, but, you know, like Oman and... Uh, various other countries all the way down to Yemen. In the middle of that, where Riyadh is, if you go south of there, about 120 miles, um, in the Jabal Tuwaik, which is a kind of a, well, it's mountainous kind of, but it's more like um, valleys and, and uh, canyons and stuff formed in the terrain there. About 120 miles south there is where we had one of our own bases, which was making... Uh, flying saucers using the uh, technology given to our people by these alleged aliens in Dr. Teller's project. Now, uh, couldn't find it again, but I thought I'd found it once in an aerial photo of the area. It uh, it was so, so well guarded that, uh, you know, you couldn't approach it on foot, on road, uh, by air or anything, and say, oh, you know, here's our call sign, we're coming in, unless you were known to be coming and invited you were shot down or killed immediately. There was no questions asked. You were not allowed to get into the facility. A very close mm-hmm. guard thing, and that's under the Saudi control. So would that be a reason why Trump went to Saudi first and then went to Israel? Is this all part of this plan they've got and the technology they've got that they're not talking about? And I heard I don't not know. Pence but one of the generals said something about a particle beam weapon that they might use on uh, Kimmy Boy. And what do you think? I mean, it just seems like there's a tie there. Well, And in, going to Antarctica is another tie. They all oh, seem yeah, to that, be going down definitely. there to watch something. Yeah, that's definitely so. Um, the, uh, the particle beam weapon you're talking about was first tested on um, – in the, the southern sea off the coast of uh, Adelaide in South Australia. I think it was about 72, 1972 when they did that, and they had the particle beam weapon on board the ship up on the deck. And the photographer that took the pictures of it, um, he set up the cameras and stuff and, and was grounded to the deck. His camera operated at 50,000 frames a second to catch the particle beam leaving the gun and hitting a target aircraft called a Jendavik aircraft, Australian aircraft, uh, for testing five miles away in the sky and destroying it. Now, um, I know the mechanics of it. I mean, it sets out a laser that ionizes a a beam right to the target. It makes like a uh, charged wire in the sky to shoot donuts around that wire of charged plasma spinning, and it goes and rips a hole in the surface of the target. So they've had that since 72, and I'm sure they've made improvements on it since then. So, yes, they could do that. uh, um, But, you know... The other countries, China, Russia, that are superpowers, they would know what had happened and whether they would announce that and uh, denounce the United States because of the use of this technology on North Korea. I don't know. <laughs> Larry, we got about five minutes left. What else would you like to know? Well, I was going to mention the, the one that you were talking about, I believe, is, uh, is uh, 
Secretary of Defense Mattis, uh, you know, General Mattis, and uh, what he said when he was talking, uh, the terminology he used was a, was a kinetic weapon. And uh, I was wondering, Stan, is the, the particle beam and the kinetic weapon the same thing, or is they different? No, no. A kinetic weapon is one that's electromagnetic, and it accelerates a projectile, which is a magnetic projectile. It accelerates at incredibly high velocities without, you know, a gaseous discharge, you know, like a bullet or something like that. And um, it has such huge energy um, that uh, when it, if it's shot from orbit, for instance, it would go down and leave a, a hot path all the way to the target, which would be detected by most uh, nations that have, uh, you know, satellite tracking or whatever. They'd see that on their screens. Uh, the other way is to put it on a naval craft, because I know the Navy was big in the particle beam technology. Uh, even mm-hmm. the new uh, aircraft carrier that uh, President Trump was on when they uh, christened it, that has its catapults using these railgun things which accelerate aircraft as though, you know, they could have been a, a uh, you know, a, um, an object to use as a railgun projectile, but they're having troubles with that on board the deck of that craft, not working properly. But it was the same idea: use electromagnetic, uh, you know, pulses and accelerate the, the plane, and then the plane could take off once it was airborne, being thrown off the ship like that. So, if you imagine that technology uh, being much more advanced and uh, on board, say, a, a craft like that, it could launch a projectile off of the deck of a large uh, aircraft carrier. Um, on to a target like uh, North Korea. So what he said uh, may well be true. Well, what was interesting, too, was that Trump said that uh, Kim was probably not going to be around much longer. <laughs> well, well, you know, no one could blame him if he did take him out. I mean, the guy is just, uh, no, uh, the rocket boy needs to go home <laughs> permanently. Yeah. Any last words you'd like to say? Uh, and by the way, thank you for coming on again. Uh, really well, appreciate you coming on, Stan. What else would you like to tell the people before we close? Um, well, um, I, I'd keep my eyes peeled for this kind of um, uh, uh, alien invasion type thing. The, the South Pole has been of uh, a lot of interest uh, with the uh, the. Uh, visits of various world leaders from Australia down in fact some of our things like uh, uh, Kerry went down there and an astronaut and nobody goes down there for vacation so keep watching for news from the Antarctic and for the revealing of you know our friendly elder brothers in space somewhere on the planet I, I think the time is coming for that very soon mm. how about you Larry oh I just have to echo what uh, Stan was saying and uh, Especially tell people uh, don't become discouraged. Uh, we, you know, I believe what Stan said. We're in a very interesting season uh, that's uh, maybe weeks long, months long. We don't really know, but uh, don't become discouraged. Uh, keep your chin up, so to speak, and keep looking up. Absolutely. Yeah, it seems like uh, sudden destruction might not be too far away. Actually. <laughs> uh, you know, like the Bible says, it, sudden destruction actually means it just comes out of the blue, totally unexpected, except by the people that are watching. So I guess my advice to everybody is really do keep watching. And uh, we don't know. Um, he may come on Feast of Atonement. He might come next year on the Feast of Atonement or maybe Feast of Trumpets. We don't know. So we got to keep an eye open. And once again, I guess uh, we really appreciate you having uh, you on, Stan and Larry, too. Um, it's been an amazing show, a lot of information that people need to to keep uh, an eye out for. And uh, I don't know. I just think we're we're very, very close to something. And I think most people feel it, don't you, Stan? I mean, there's just I something do. in I the do. air about it. I keep thinking about so, that statement in the Bible about uh, when they show call, you know, uh, cry peace and safety, then will sudden destruction be upon them. I'm wondering if that means that they think they've got peace and safety or whether they're crying out for it when the destruction hits and who that they are. Something for people to do. Yeah, investigate. good point. I'm not sure which it is, so we've got to watch. Anyway, thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll see you once again, the Lord willing. Good night.
Good night.